So, hey, welcome back to the uh, the Aerospace Executive Podcast. Once again, I am really happy to have my good friend Bill Alderman uh, on with me. Uh, Bill is the uh, the president and CEO of Alderman and Company. Uh, he's a sell side investment banker, a well known uh, a well known institution, and in, uh, in the uh, the M and A arena and uh, an aviation aerospace M and A. And uh, Bill, welcome, welcome back. Thanks, Greg. Great to have you. You know, I love being on your podcast and I listen to almost every one. I will admit that I miss a couple because of work and clients, but I try to make every single one and they, you do a great job. These are yeah. these are great, important podcasts. And I think most people like me in this industry pay attention to what you and your guests have to say. So thanks for inviting me again. Well, well thanks for coming on. It's always like you're you're like a breath, breath of fresh air. Um, you, no you, tell, you tell it like it is. Um, and it's all, uh, it's all good. You should, so, uh, you should ask the guys who work for me. They may not say I'm a breath of fresh. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good thing too, but uh, you know. it's all good. So, so here we are. It's, uh, the, kind of, uh, the get ready to be the fourth quarter of 2024. The fed has, uh, the, the fed has driven interest rates up to a level we haven't seen since the, uh, the early eighties. Since I had hair in my head, Craig. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's crazy when you start to think about you know people trying to buy houses now at seven percent and yep. they're freaking out. They've never seen you know, a lot of yeah. people have never seen this type of environment. A lot, you know, a number of CEOs in our industry have never seen high interest rates, literally it, during their entire career. You know, because you started your job after grad school, or whatever. You're 26 years old, right? And you are running a company now, and you're 46 years old. And in the past 20 years, you've never seen high interest rates. There are people running companies, talented people, men and women, mm -hmm. never seen high interest rates. It's yeah. new to them. You know, I think about when I bought my house back in 2007. Yeah. I got like a 5.75% 30-year mortgage. And I was jumping for joy. I was like, wow, that's that's the best mortgage I've seen in a long time. You know, people today are like, well, you're kidding me. And then, you know, the, the rates today are still relatively low based on true historic norm. Right? I know. Young I know. people don't get that. Yeah. And and just to show you, yeah, I talk about the gray hair. I'm like, I bought a, I bought a one-year CD. I, I put a big, big, you know, big number right. into a one-year CD paying 5.75%. I'm like, you got to be kidding. I feel like, I, I feel like jackpot. And uh, you're getting equity returns for no risk. It's no risk. And uh, I'm like, wow, what the hell? Where the hell do I get this? You know. So anyway, it's uh, it's crazy, but yeah. a lot of people are telling me that's affecting M and A, and it, uh, it is deal slowing down a little bit. Or what's what's going on in your world? So, um, as you know, Craig, although we've done a couple of really big deals lately, um, we uh, we typically deal in in what we call the middle market, but others would call the lower middle market. Under a hundred million dollars in revenue uh, is our typical client. Um, and not to say they're not being affected by interest rates. They are. Um, if they have borrowings that are variable, those are going up. That hurts. But it's not as big a deal for most of our clients as the cost of labor and actually as getting their hands on labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's making the headlines right now about, about unions striking. That And, you know, those are big companies with big unions that are striking. But that that tension between the cost of labor, the availability of labor, and production is flowing through to that $35 million revenue supplier. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not so much that they're having strikes because they're typically not unionized shops. They're not big enough. But they're getting pressure on wages. And the real way they're seeing it is they can't keep or attract labor. Mm -hmm. That's where we're seeing this activity having an issue on our clients. But to your exact question, your exact question was, is it affecting m and and uh, there's no doubt that although we're actually up and our backlog is up, um, you know, we're a small firm and that's anecdotal. You can't speak to the market based on just our little firm. Mm -hmm. But um, and we've been growing by other means as well. We've hired more people and we're growing because we're growing. Um, the market itself has pulled back. Um, we, we've seen that and, and we've run statistics that prove it. And clearly interest rates. And the, the cost and availability of labor has had mm -hmm. an impact on M and A activity. You know, I don't want to sell my company when I'm having trouble meeting demand. I got more important things to worry about, right? And sure. I can retire in two years. Let me just make sure my most important customers are happy with me before I go to market. I mean, it's mm -hmm. rational thinking, right? Um, interest rates are up. My concern is buyers are going to pay less for my company. I think that's overblown. Um, but it is a legitimate concern, and it quite frankly doesn't matter. And it, this sounds a little silly, but it, it's been my experience for 30 years. 
the reality of M and A doesn't really matter nearly as much as the perception. So if I'm a seller and I think buyers may offer me lower prices, I am not going to want to even test the market. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's a little bit of, of perception driving reality, but there's no doubt interest rates have put pressure on deals. It has had an impact on less deals and lower prices, but it, I think it's way overblown. Um, and we have anecdotal evidence to prove it. And there are deals getting done out there in the teens of multiples in this mm -hmm. sector, commercial aviation. Um, so I, I don't think it's as as big an issue as as m might be perceived. The mm -hmm. real issue that we're seeing, and which is where I want to take the conversation, is there is this um, almost a world of 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 two halves. Um that we're seeing in commercial aviation. And I'm gonna to stick to commercial aviation for mm -hmm. a bit here. Um, and that's where we're seeing a lot of activity. A lot of our deal flow right now and a lot of our pipeline is commercial aviation. There's defense work, but it, it hasn't swung like commercial aviation has. Um, defense is sort of stable. And the, and the issue with, with Russia, the issues with, with China are sort of baked in. The numbers are coming up. I mean, if we have a government shutdown, God help us all. But yeah, let's not go there, right? Yeah. But assuming weird things don't happen, the defense budget is where it is. I don't care who who takes over the next administrative executive uh um branch, whether who's the president, defense spending can't change very much. We have threats we need to fund. Okay, you can tweak the edges, but it's not going to mm -hmm. move very far from 800 billion dollars either direction. That's a lot of money, right? And and mm -hmm. so the defense market is stable, MA activity is stable. Commercial aviation is a fascinating case study. And I'll share with you some facts and statistics here. We're still trying to figure this out, all right? We know our deal flow is up. We know we've got clients in the market as we speak, and we know we've got clients that have asked us to take them to market early in, in call it later September, early in the, in the next quarter. Mm -hmm. So anecdotally, we know something's going on here where the market is becoming active in, in commercial m and the question is sort of why, and it, it's it's really, we look at the data and it's bifurcated. So let me throw some stats at you. I'm not going to go crazy because I don't want to bore your audience, okay. um, but I want to throw some stats because they're important to us. That's how we run our practice. All right, let's start with the TSA, right? TSA has been running good stats ever since the pandemic hit, and it's, it's great information. It's TSA I think gov, and it's available in the public domain. All right, so we got to be a little careful with statistics. Labor Day was the 4th of September this year. Mm -hmm. And the comparison period I want to do here is August 31st, end of the month. It's the most recent month end we got, right? Today is September 8th. Um, August 31st, throughput TSA data was 2.6 million folks. To be exact, mm -hmm. 2.599. Okay? okay. Pre-pandemic, 2019, that day... Right, the 31st of August was 2,109,000 and change. Two point. Wow. Okay. It's roughly a 23% increase. Now, mm -hmm. we just got to be clear about our statistics because I really don't like it when people mess with statistics. Just to be clear, right? You got to impact Labor Day in there. And people travel right the beginning and end of Labor Day. It can skew the numbers. And so, just full disclosure, September 4th, four days later, was Labor Day this year. And September 2nd, two days later, was Labor Day in 2019. I think those don't really matter a whole lot, but it doesn't matter. People have the data. They can do what they want with it. Regardless, traffic's up 23%, okay? And, and if you look at the day before, the 30th traffic was up 6%, and the day after, traffic was up 24%, and the day after that, traffic is up 19%. So, I mean... It's up, all right? Whether you like 20% or 23% or you want to adjust it for labor, I don't care what you want to do with the stat. Good luck convincing me it's not up, okay? It's yeah. up. All it's right. up. It's up from the pandemic when it was really, really, really down, right? Okay? And so here's the first fact set. We are out of COVID. Now, I'm not saying people aren't getting COVID, right? We have family members who got COVID and they were a little bit sick and they had to miss a little day of work or something. COVID is here and I'm not going into politics. COVID mm -hmm. is here. It's not gone forever, but we are done with shutdowns like mm -hmm. we had to deal with in 2020. Okay. Right. And this is not going to politics because I don't like that crap. I like facts. 
we're out of the pandemic from a traffic on airplanes perspective. Okay. Mm -hmm. Period. Full stop. Now, here's what that means. All right. Numbers, fact set, Delta. Okay. It, <laughs> these numbers blow me away. Delta for the quarter, right? It reported last quarter, which was the latest was June. $15.6 billion for the quarter of revenue, right? Mm -hmm. They made a profit of $2.5 billion for the three months operating income. Okay. Right. Operating, no, no accounting games, no, no nonsense. $2.5 billion is theirs to keep. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Okay. That's a mm -hmm. nice business. Craig, the airlines were never a nice business. No, they, they I mean, no, no. When in our lifetime did they make money? Right? They're figuring, maybe they're figuring it out. Uh, you know, it's, it's, they start to make money and then things like pandemics come their way. And I mean, who was know? the, wasn't it Richard Branson who said, if you want to be a millionaire, start with a billion and, and then, and then buy an airline. <laughs> but, but you know, but the but the CFO of American Airlines got up in front of his investors and said, "We'll never lose money again." And that yeah, was in 2019. Well, you know, so don't, don't not go in there. Look, uh, but look, look, it's it's just tough business. I mean, it's tough. But yeah, yeah but, but this, Delta, yeah, wherever yeah. it is, my camera's making me go away. This is yeah. good news. All right, right. yeah, that kind of earnings bodes well for the entire supply chain. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So digging down a few more statistics. This is my happy world. Okay. So. TSA numbers are up. Well, guess what? The airlines are making money. That makes That's a lot good. of sense. I want companies okay. to make money. All right. Now, the supply chain. All right. If you're in the business of supporting Delta in flying around airplanes, mm -hmm. you're also making money. Singapore, ST Engineering, right? They're, they're all over the world. They have a big presence in MRO, yep. big presence here in the United States, down in Mobile, Alabama. I've known those guys for years. They do world-class work. Um, Quote, the commercial, this is their, their quarterly report. Um, this was published August 11th. The commercial aerospace segment saw 32% year-over-year revenue increase to $1.9 billion. Okay? So Singapore is saying, well, you may have 16% increase, Delta, mm -hmm. and the TSA may have a 23% increase, but we had a 32% increase. Okay? Yep. I mean, okay. AAR. Another another supply chain provider in commercial aviation, right? Fourth quarter sales, and, and they have unique quarters. June is their fourth quarter. Up 16% year over year. Okay? All right. Yep. So, so there, I mean, not, this isn't rocket science. I'm not telling a lot of your audience members sort of what they don't know, but I'm about to go into the bad news. Okay? Yep. Whether it's a commercial aviation aftermarket player, MRO, new production, or quite frankly, defense or business aviation, we tell all of our clients that for the most part, your valuation is more tied to your programs than it is to your customers. Now, that's not across the board always true, but it's a pretty wide mm -hmm. rush. I agree with, I agree with you. Okay. So now let me go into the whoops, you're on the wrong program, bad news. Okay. okay. So Delta's doing great. Delta's suppliers are doing great. The MRO players are doing great. Airbus is doing great. Okay. You could argue it could be doing better, but Airbus for the quarter ended June, and they do they do half year numbers. So I can't mm -hmm. really give you quarter numbers. What they publish are half year numbers for the period ended June 30th. So um <laughs> they had 27, and these are euros, 27 billion euros up from 24 billion the period before. And they had 1.5 billion euros of profit. Mm -hmm. okay? It pales in comparison, I guess, to Delta. But, um, you know, hey, you're still making over 1.4 billion euros. Not too bad. So there's the good news. Your, your TSA related, your airline related, you're a supplier to the airlines. You're Airbus, you're an Airbus supplier. Everybody's making money. Mm -hmm. Pandemic's over. Nice day. Well, not quite. So let's talk about our Boeing supply chain friends. Okay. I had lunch yesterday anecdotally with a gentleman, been making parts in the Boeing supply chain world for years. And he, he's beside himself at what's going on in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, 
Boeing airplanes, quarterly financial statements in my hand. Mm -hmm. The commercial airplane group, division, whatever, department of Boeing lost $383 million ended June. Yep. Boeing Defense, which we're not talking about, but just for giggles here, lost a half a billion dollars for the period. Okay. Let's talk about Boeing supply chain. Spirit lost $120 million for the quarter. Uh, latest article uh, in the trade press, quote, latest Boeing 737 repairs delay many near-term deliveries. Okay, great. Next, in the press, about five, no, August 29th, Boeing service instruction errors prompt new 777 inspections, says FAA. And one more, and then I'm done. Spirit Aerosystems, press release, August 23rd. We are aware of quality issues involving elongated fastener holes in the air aft pressure bulkhead on certain models of the 737 produced by Spirit Aerosystems. We have implemented changes to our production processes to address this issue. Mm -hmm. it does, I mean, it can't get worse, right? It yeah. can't get worse. And so I, uh, if, you're a, if you're an Airbus supplier or an airline supplier, we are out of the pandemic and things are great. And if you are a Boeing production supplier, things are a mess. And this is back to where we were pre-pandemic, which mm -hmm. is this. And then I'll quit my pontificating for a minute. During the pandemic, we were all in a world of hurt. The world was a mess. It just, it was awful. Okay. And it took a long time to recover. Mm -hmm. We are out. We're done. And every well-run company is benefiting from a healthy industry good management, and they're mm -hmm. making profits. Yep. And this is not a Boeing bashing session. I'm not going there. I'm just stating facts. If you are programmatically tied to Boeing, this is a difficult time for you. It's got nothing to do with the industry. It's that your customer has actual operating problems. Mm -hmm. And that flows right down onto you. All right. I'm done with my speech. I could never figure it out. You know, look, so a lot, a lot of things you're saying resonate well. The small, you know, I took a bunch of notes. Small players. Interest rates are up. Their banks are probably squeezing them a little bit because, you know, banks are going to start to tighten. Labor's up. Fuel's up. You know, small players don't necessarily have pricing power that they want. You know, you got a Honeywell. Honeywell wants 100, you know, I don't know if they do now or not, but they were wanting 180 day mm -hmm. price terms. Now you're a small supplier, fifty fifty million dollars of revenue, mm -hmm. making a couple of key widgets and selling Honeywell, and all of a sudden your labor costs are up thirty percent, your fuel costs are up, your your you know, your insurance rates are up on the meds on the medical side. They're going to go up six and a half percent this year, and then Honeywell says, "Oh, your material costs are up." Mm -hmm. And then Honeywell says, "I want 180 day payment terms." Yeah, basically finance my supply chain. You know, it's, it's it's really hard for a small. It's brutal, and yeah. it, it's brutal, Craig. You, and you're onto it. And, and here's the thing, and this is what we say to our clients: if if we get a call that says, "Hey, I want to retire in six years. What should I do?" Yeah. Our, assuming they're in this niche, our comment to them always is, "You you need to be on the right programs, mm -hmm. and you need to be diversified." Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a time when Boeing was the best in of the best and you didn't want to be on Douglas or you mm. didn't want to be on the member of the TriStar, the Lockheed TriStar. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Which was engineering wise from great airplane I've spoken to the better airplane. Right. There was the there was the TriMotor DC-10 yep. sounding old here, Craig, but it's an important case study. The TriMotor DC-10 and the TriMotor Lockheed TriStar L-1011. Right. Everybody I've spoken to, like for real engineering pilot types, that L-1011 was a better airplane. That was, I believe, the first airplane to be allowed to go Cat 3C-00. I believe that's the, the history, okay? okay? The first commercial airliner to go 00, zero with commercial mm -hmm. traffic. Um, but the engines, it had the, the, the uh, what was it, the CF-680C2? Uh, was it the ADC two or the CF six fifties or the Rolls? No, it was the Rolls. So the Rolls had uh, the Rolls yeah, engines. The Rolls. That's, I'm sorry, right? The Rolls, yeah. And the DC ten, the DC ten, and the CF sixes. Yeah, and, and it was the Rolls motor was overweight. That's what it yeah. was. RB two elevens. Exactly, and that and it took the entire mm -hmm. entire program down. Yep. Right, 
And mm-hmm. so if you were a supplier on the L1011, you, you, whatever you put in, you lost. Yep. And the inferior aircraft, the DC-10, took off and was a wild success until the tri-motor was no longer an effective aircraft. Yep. The point I'm making is you never really know, okay? If you'd asked me 20 years ago, is Airbus going to be engineering-wise, production-wise, operation-wise, dramatically superior than Boeing at some point? I'd say that's not going to happen. They're just going to compete, yep. right? right? Today, right, Boeing really has problems, okay? Yep. If you were sole source Boeing, you are in a world of hurt, right? Mm-hmm. And if you have a diversified book, so you're on some business jets and you're on the Airbus aircraft portfolio and you are on some military aircraft, mm-hmm. the fact that Boeing is really in a world of hurt, you can survive. The market is up. People are making a profit and your healthy customers will treat you well. Yep. If you are solely in that supply chain, and I don't blame Honeywell, if if Honeywell is is desperate because mm-hmm. the piece of its business that is Boeing related is getting destroyed, mm-hmm. right? It's got no choice but to try and salvage that business by beating up on its supply chain. It, it's a death spiral for everybody. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and this comes down to you know, you obviously you're an investment banker. I'm in the people business, and you know, like I'm just a, I just got to be you're a, a nice guy. You're I a nice guy, a, and I'm I just not, got a business. Right? Degree, I got a business degree from Texas Tech, you know, and 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 my GPA. My kids laugh at my GPA when they hear it. So, I'm not going to stand up in the ranks of the smart guys. But I see, I see the intelligence. I mean, you know, the I talk to people at Boeing all the time. I'm like, damn, these are smart people. I talk to people at Spirit all the time. Damn, they're smart. And UTC, you know, they're a Raytheon now, and. You know, I talked to a lady from L3 the other day yesterday, and I'm like, wow, really smart people. But for some reason, Boeing has been organized in spirit. Yep. They've been organizationally unable to execute for more than a decade. And if there were two companies right now that were just ripe for activist investors, mm-hmm. Boeing is one of them. And, and quite frankly, if someone came in, so we're going to split Boeing up into three different companies. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't argue with that. Um, so, so yeah. Craig, you know, we could have a really philosophical conversation about, you know, yeah. I had a friend once um, and I, I think he was at McKinsey and and I have a kid there, so I'm biased. Um, but um, I think I think the comment was that there are dis economies of scale. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not sure it was it was actually his personal thinking, but it was his comment to me at the time. And look, I've worked for GE. I worked for big companies. I've been there, right? Um, I don't necessarily think it's that it's that big companies tend to fail, right? I, I don't think it's that. I, I think what it is is cultural, mm-hmm. and um, I don't want to say negative things. I want to say positive things. And so, you know, you can argue that Airbus has golden shares with the French government and they have allegiance to the German government and they're quasi state owned and they're socialist. And you can say all those things, which may be true. OK. Mm-hmm. But they are culturally acting in a way where they care about their customers, mm-hmm. they care about their engineering and their quality of their product. Mm-hmm. They are focused on economics. They care about economics. They want to sell their airplanes at an affordable price and they want to make a profit. Mm-hmm. But it is not the only and single thing they care about. Right. And that's how you run a company for generations and mm-hmm. you make great products. I, I sat in Switzerland when I was still in the Navy. I uh, I, I drove down from you know, Northern Germany and, and was in Gestad, Switzerland, doing some skiing for a weekend. I sat in a, in a bar yeah, with a... Place guy who was a, actually an Airbus engineer. He's a software engineer for Airbus. He was telling me what they were going to do. Yeah, their whole mentality about the cockpit systems and how, you know, pilots were not necessarily going to be, you know, and you think if it's, you know, Boeing, the pilots in control, Airbus, right. you know, software. And and yep. I looked at him like, you're nuts. You guys are crazy. You're nuts. But wow, you know, here I am, you know, now 30 years later thinking, you know, these guys were onto something from an engineering mindset. Right. And, 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 you know, that has shaped that engineering mindset has totally shaped that company. Um, 
you know, I can say revolutionized. You know, the, the A320 is a great airplane. Look, I'm not, and I'm, and I'm actually a fan of the Max. I mean, I like the Max. I fly on the Max all the time. It's a comfortable airplane. Right. Um, I like it. Right. You know, yeah. pilots of Southwest that I talk to, they like it. They're like, oh, we're good. We're good with it. It, it, it's like an F-150. It's like a King Air. Yeah. It's just a really reliable machine. Right. right. It's it's just I find that, you know, the it's look, I I, I don't know where Boeing lost its way. Right. Um, it hires really, really smart people. I'm, I'm certainly the not best. gonna the best. I'm not digging anybody, anybody, but for some reason, somewhere in the C suite, it lost its way. And if you talk to Richard Abalafi, he'll tell you it started with Harry Stonecipher. Well, and I've heard the same argument, and I think Richard Abalafia is one of the smartest guys yeah. in this world. Look, yeah. um, and again, I don't want to bash Boeing. When no, I, no, no, we'll get up. We're gonna I, I want to speak to your your audience and my audience. Um, and if you're in the Boeing supply chain, right, it, it, I'm empathetic, right? Because yeah. it's just a hard place to be right now. Right? Yeah, and, and, and I'm not. Now. I'm not disagreeing, but go back to MRO. Yeah, you're yeah. saying the MRO segment. Yeah, it's really good. I was I did a podcast last week with Sam Hamoud. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sam, Sam at FTI. Right. And I love what these guys are doing at FTI. Right. Yeah, you know, they they they're young. Yep. They're hungry. They're eager. They're smart. Yep. They're in every engine deal that's out there. They're, you know, it's like you got an engine deal out there. Yeah, I'm bidding against FTI. They got, you know. And they're figuring out how to make money, and I like and I love it. And yeah. and you and know, the supply and chain needs motors right now. The supply right? chain needs motors. You can't you can't have your revenue up sixteen percent and not have a supply of motors. Yeah. Right. You know that's the whole thing, and that's the MRO. They've got their quick turn engine center down in. Uh, they got the quick turn engine center down in Miami. Yeah. They're partnering with uh, Lockheed on the module factory up in Montreal. Yep. And they just figured out. You know, they figured out something that, hey, look, we see this gap in the market. Let's go capitalize on it. I yeah. love it. And they're young. And they're just, they're, they're doing it. Um, so, you know, it, it, in terms of M&A, we are, and we're seeing anecdotal evidence of this. Guys that are in that Spirit, Boeing, Honeywell to Boeing supply chain, um, it's, it's, it's not a great time for M&A right now. It's really not. If you if you're 65 percent revenue to Boeing, mm -hmm. um, especially wide body content, it's just a it's a it's a tough place to be. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else in commercial aviation right now, I think in the fourth quarter we're going to see a fair amount of activity, because what what really has happened here it's not that there is magically a need for more M and A. Mm -hmm. that, that's just not where we are in the world. What we are where we are in the world is that that. And, and in part, industries mature and consolidate, right? And aviation is a 100-year-old industry, but it's already pretty consolidated. And there's nothing mm -hmm. unique about 2023 in terms of the evolution of aviation, okay? Mm -hmm. What there is unique in 2023 is that we just came out of a 100-year pandemic, right? We don't mm -hmm. do this very often, right? And really, no one alive, I mean, I, I guess there are people technically alive that remember the last pandemic in 1917, right, 101 years ago. But for the most part, none of us have been through this before. The modern world has never been through this before. And we just got out of this crazy thing, right? And so what really happened was that, that and a lot of our clientele are, are people who retire, founded the business, don't have a kid in the business, want to retire. Yep. And so what there really is, is there is pent up demand. That's all. It's like, you know, why did so many people get on airplanes right after oh, the pandemic yeah. sort of ended? Because they were sick and tired of not traveling, right? right? Okay. And so eventually that growth rate of like 40% coming out of the pandemic is going to stabilize and just stay at a normal level. Right? Well, the, what, what, what the pandemic did was it changed, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, we're, you know, people say, well, we'll see the ripple effects of this. Through 20. I think you're see the ripple effects of this till 2030, because you talk about like right. people don't want to go to work anymore. So office building rents. Yes. So now the big the big thing everybody's looking at now is middle market banks and saying, wait a minute, how much bad real estate or right. potentially bad real estate is on your books? You know, and right. once again, it's the work from home or hybrid workforce or people downsizing offices creating a big glut. Yep. Um, it's the fact that people are now sort of, hey, look, it's not necessarily the business traveler any, anymore, but it's the person, you know, telecommute, you know, we're in, and and they want to jump on, they want to go work from, you know, uh, you know, they want to go work from Indianapolis this week. So they're jumping on an airplane. Greg, and you know, it's crazy. Our firm, our firm is remote. 
Okay. Yep. We're completely mm-hmm. remote. Yeah. Um, one of my one of my one of my associates the other day, I'm like, where are you? He goes, uh, I'm in New Orleans. I'm like, how is it? He goes, it's really nice. I like being here. I'm like, how long are you gonna be there for? He goes, I think four or five days. But I, I, look, as long as he's working, I don't care yeah. where he is, right? I hear and, you. So for, for, and not everybody wants this, but for some people, this working remote thing, they love it for some people, right? <laughs> I agree with you, it's changing the world a fair amount. But to my comment about MA, what happened was that that 65-year-old person that wanted to retire in 2020 is like, well, my business has dropped by 70%. I don't think I'm going to sell my business right now. So it was the person that was going to retire in 20, 21, and 22 Mm -hmm. that literally there's three years worth of M&A that didn't take place. Right. And so, and our statistics are there's roughly in our market about 400 deals a year. That's all of aerospace and defense. Okay. Okay. All of it. And that's not our entirely our core market. That's all of AD. We track about 400 deals a year. That's about over a 20 year period of time. It's pretty consistent. Yeah. Obviously, during pandemics, the numbers change, right? But if 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 there were 400 deals a year meant to be done for the past three years, okay, let's say half of those were the pure commercial aviation sector. 200 deals a year for three deals, rough numbers, 600 deals, right? Right. What he got done, damn close to zero. Okay. So if the argument is, gee, there was pent up demand for 600 deals, there should be 200 deals a year, right? If we do 300 deals a year, it's going to be what, 2027 before we've cleared the backlog, Mm -hmm. right? And so I'm not saying this thing's going to explode with activity. I'm saying that there is a meaningful amount of pent up demand, natural demand, not, gee, let's consolidate the industry nonsense. Right. is nonsense. But legitimately, there's like 300 people that wanted to retire that founded their companies 40 years ago that can't retire. Yep. And that's pent up. And that's what we're seeing. Those are the phone calls that I'm getting. Bill, interest rates are high. When should I do? I've been holding on for three years. I'm sick and tired of this. I live in Florida now. Get me out. Mm-hmm. Right. And the conversation is, well, look, if you wait another six months, you yep. can get a fair price for your business. Okay. Yep. Interest rates are cooling out. Everybody's making more money. The market is getting healthier. And we've been advising clients. I mean, we have one client, literally, we've been talking to them for 24 months about when to pull the trigger. Right now, the date looks like October 15th to be the is the magic date. Who the hell knows? Mm-hmm. But I mean, literally for two years, we've been saying to this, th- these owners, um, and there's a couple of them, when can we get out? And the conversation is, I think October 15th, and we're dialing the numbers and all the rest of it. It's playing out pretty true. I mean, right. their earnings have just been going up every single month. Um, Sort of, sort of like you would expect. So yeah, I mean, I'm looking at I'm looking at AAR stock as I'm I'm looking looking left. Yeah, you know, fifty seven bucks on AAR stock to an all time high, all time high, all time right. high. I right. mean, it, and, and and you know what? Uh, you know, G East. I was I was sitting with some bankers a couple months ago, and they're like, "What do you, yeah. do you like?" I go, "Look, if you bet against GE now, you you got rocks in your head." Yeah, leap one A one B, leap one A one B. Great engines. Um, they're going to capitalize on Pratt and Whitney's struggles. Yeah. My friend John yeah. Slattery is a EVP uh, over there. Yeah, um, I love like, I love G. Right my, you can't really see this with the darn computer thing, but look, I'm holding the AR uh, quarterly press release. Right. Um, yeah. The reason the stock price is screaming high is because their earnings are screaming high. Yeah. It's not rocket science. Right. I mean, investors aren't stupid. The company's making a lot of money. So I, I again, I go back to this bifurcated market that we're out of the pandemic. Everybody's doing well. I just feel really bad for my friends that are in that Boeing supply chain. It, they're not, it, they're not doing well. Right. I suppose that'll turn at some point. Maybe not. I don't mean, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I suppose it'll turn, but I think at uh, Boeing, I think, I think Boeing's got to give, give right. a big, some, somehow, some way, sh- shape or form, it's got to give some confidence to the market that it can execute. So and, I, I, and I, I, can I'll execute. comment to you about, about Boeing, We'll recover someday. Mm -hmm. So I really, I am a capitalist, right? I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. why wouldn't an investment banker be a pure capitalist, right? But I'm, I'm somewhat of a free market capitalist. I'm not, I don't believe in totally free markets, but um, I do believe in the free markets. And I remember as a kid that um, people would poo poo Japanese autos. Yeah. You know, who'd, who'd want to buy one of those, right? Those are crap. Oh yeah. I remember that. I remember those days too. And 
I, I just remember people, smart people saying, give them time, just give them yeah. time. And it got to a point where the average American was saying, I'd rather buy a Honda or Toyota because mm-hmm. those are quality cars for a price and the American cars are crap. Well, mm-hmm. eventually the American car crap went away, but there were some years when, I mean, America made bad cars for a oh, while. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. No, they're horrible. I mean, they, they drove off the lot and they broke, right? I mean, yeah. seriously, I remember those days. Yeah. And I was I was in a meeting this past week, honest to God, and a gentleman who's very wealthy uh, said he was looking at buying one of the brand new Ferraris. It's like a yeah. half a million dollar car, okay? And, and he said, but you know what? I think I'm going to buy the new Corvette. It's 700 horsepower and she's gorgeous and she's less expensive. And I'm like, you know, there was a time when a guy like that would have never considered buying an American car, yeah. right? And here he is, buy any car in the world, and he wants to buy the Corvette. Why? Because it's a damn good car, right? right? So here's my view on Boeing. They're either going to get their ass kicked enough by Airbus that someone's going to demand they make a great product at a great price, right? Mm-hmm. Or, th- or they're just going to go out of business. And as an American... I hope they don't go out of business, but my guess is they got to suffer more before they're really going to get their act together, just like Detroit. Yeah. Three things like here's a couple, here's my prognosis on the whole thing. Singer, you know, Starboard, one of the big activists, one of the big activist firms is probably, you know, looking at them and going, we're going to take a big interest. My guess is, is that the government has played a big role in that not happening. Um, just because of the DOD contracts mm-hmm. and the importance to the defense. Mm-hmm. But I think an activist is going to come in there some way, shape, or form, and it's going to do a shakeup of either the board or the C-suite. And then they're going to start to carve out the business a little bit. So, you know, you know Boeing Capital, there's there's plenty of competition for Boeing Capital. You're going to go away. We're not funding that anymore. Mm-hmm. Boeing Defense, we're going to make you your own little island. Boeing Training Systems, you're going to be, you know, they're going to you know, start to carve it up some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Second thing is, you know, they've already come out and said they're not building a new airliner for 10 years. You know, you know, here's here's the challenge with that is a new airliner needs a completely new design because the environmentalists are, you know, it's it's a three prong. You know, you got the environmentalists out there that are demanding more, which requires new engines. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, Rolls Royce GE or or Raytheon aren't in a position where they want to go invest a couple billion dollars in designing new engines. So we're not going to see more airliners or, or significantly radical designs until somewhere in the mid 2030s, I think, maybe closer to 2040 right. until, you know, until engine technology shifts. I mean, it's, so it's yeah. going to be, we got to force these guys to get better and better and better and better. But what, you know, it's, it becomes a, it almost becomes a general motors lean six Sigma exercise, efficiency, execution, things of the sort. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the meantime, you've got these smaller players that are, you know, they're, you know, um, they're getting squeezed, but a lot of them are doing quite well. They're figuring out being small. You know, right. I, I, I was with a small company last week and all their marketing is word of mouth and they're killing it. They're just, they're killing it. They're doing great. They don't right. want to be big. They just want to be small and you know, small and profitable. Right. Like, I'm good with that. So interesting times we're in. Fascinating times. Fascinating times, Craig. Interesting times. So good. So how do people get a hold of you, Bill? Um, <clears throat> probably the best way to get me is by email. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, email address is WA, my initials, WA at aldermanco.com. That's the website. And I'll give uh, to your special audience my cell phone number, which I don't give out, which is 914 very good. Thanks for coming on. I, as always, it's a great conversation. I enjoy it, Craig. I always enjoy it. All the best, my friend. Thanks, Bill. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com, or check us out at www.NorthStarESG.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.